Wait, remember PB and J Otter? I was remembering it the other week myself and then, oh, Disney Plus added it to their catalog. Sure, I'll revisit this show. I remember watching it growing up and you know, I could use some good cheering up with a very good natured show. So as a full grown adult, I said to myself, yeah, today I'm watching PB and J Otter. PB and J Otter was a series that aired on Disney Channel following the day to day challenges of three Otter siblings. Over the course of the series, we get to meet their neighbors and just watching PB and J Otter it feels like this warm embrace of childhood in the most comforting way. The childlike voices, low stakes, charming animation, and adorable characters. It feels like being at home and eating your favorite childhood meal or snack. Or a PB&J sandwich would be more appropriate, I guess. If you enjoy this video, you better freaking subscribe. And if you aren't craving a peanut butter and jelly sandwich by the end of this video, I will not have done my job correctly. You wouldn't be interested. It's a grown-up kid thing. Welcome back to the 25 Days of Fringe Miss, where there's going to be brand Brand new videos every single day from December 1st to December 25th. Hop aboard. This was easier than I thought. Premiering on Playhouse Disney on March 15th, 1998, PB&J Otter was one of those creations of the beloved Jim Jenkins. Jenkins also had a hand in creating other series like Doug, Allegra's Window, Jojo Circus, and Stanley, among many others. Easily unbeknownst to me as a child gave me some of my earliest cartoon experiences and locked away nostalgia for it all. Thank you, Jim. Early on in his career, he was heavily inspired by puppeteering in kids' media, especially Bert and Ernie in Sesame Street. Other inspirations for his works were Charlie Brown and Rocky and Bullwinkle. At a young age, Jenkins moved to Columbus, Ohio, attending the Ohio State University to pursue a career in animation. Go Buckeyes. I'm not even a sports fan. I don't know why I even said that. From there, he was hired to work on shows like Pinwheel and Hocus Focus in the late 70s. It wasn't until the early 90s when Jenkins was given the creative freedom to create his own show, which was called Doug, aka one of the first three Nicktoons ever created. It's pretty niche. I wouldn't be surprised if any of you have never heard of it before. After the success of Doug, Jenkins went on to create more really formative younger age demographic shows, including PB and J Otter. The series itself was produced by David Campbell, as well as Harvard University's cognitive skills group called Project Zero, which is just so intensely named, like OK Zeta Project. When I think about what Project Zero could be, I think about some kind of high security underground psyop, not a children's learning initiative. In Jim Jenkins' words, PB and J Otter was made to be a simple little show about otters just trying to get through their day. The series focuses on a family of otters, clearly, specifically three otter siblings, who live in a houseboat on Lake Hoo-Ha. Yeah, apparently Al Pacino is the owner of it. Hoo-Ha! Coming up next, it's peanut, baby butter, and jelly in PB&J Otter. Get ready for PB and J Otter. Peanut Otter is the oldest sibling. Voiced by Adam Rose, he has red fur, and despite being the oldest sibling, he's really kind and loyal to his younger sisters. Jelly Otter is the middle sibling, voiced by Janelle Wilson, formerly Janelle Slack. Jelly is purple furred and tends to take on the role as leader when with her siblings. She's characterized as creative and marches to the beat of her own drum. The youngest of the family is Baby Butter Otter with brown fur, voiced by Gina Marie Tortorici. Although, Baby Butter is presented as too young to fully speak proper sentences, we do get some repetition and occasional exclamations from the youngest sibling. We also get to know the rest of their family, including Opal Otter, voiced by Gwen Shepard, who plays a very traditional, caring mother role who can be strict when she needs to be. She is very social with the other women in her community and is known for her seamstressing skills. Voiced by Chris Phillips, Ernest Otter is their father who runs his business out of their boat home, selling a variety of items as a general store. He's always pretty pretty busy and tends to pick up odd jobs around the town when he can or when he's not playing his bagpipes. We also meet the friends of the Otter siblings, like Scooch and Pinch Raccoon, Munchy Beaver, Flick Duck, and Frenemy Poodle Twins, Ootsy and Bootsy Snooty. That is the best list of character names I think I've ever heard. But in all seriousness, although they pose as the more traditional antagonists of the series, which that term is super flexible here, they are shown to actually have a good time with the Otters when they aren't being super freaking posh. 
These are things that I appreciate in wholesome little shows, because it highlights that there's people who aren't just this way or that way. There's always a bit of complexity in a formative mind. And these poodles, they're just kids. All three main voice actors for the siblings were children themselves when they voiced their characters, only a few years older than the otters. While Adam and Janelle were able to read their lines, Gina often had to just repeat the lines that one of the team members fed to her. While it may be more time consuming to invest in child actors like this, it gave the show this extra sweet little layer that felt so honest. And toward the end of the series, Adam voiced his concerns about the changes in his voice, and even recalls that they had to pitch him up a little in a few episodes toward the end. Jenkins recalls it as a race with a puberty clock, so they had to rush to finish the end of the series quickly. Now, clearly, I am an adult. I know that this show isn't made for adults in mind. Now, in most cartoons, there are some layers to shows that allow hidden jokes that kids won't get until they become adults themselves. This here isn't the case as this was aimed at an even younger demographic, meaning it was very cookie cutter clean, which isn't a bad thing, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that it makes sense for who this show is for, and just knowing that any episode I watch are just these little daily looks into these otters, very tame life on a lake. It just fills my heart with joy. It's so small scope and simple that it's hard to really not like, and even if you don't, it's literally impossible to say that you hate it. It's just too pure and innocent to be perceived as anything other than it is, a cute little show for a younger demographic. Was I thoroughly entertained throughout the rewatch? No. Did I take anything away from my viewing in the form of the lessons and morals shown in the show? No. It's very basic common knowledge to me, obviously. But it has this infectious charm where I still had a smile on my face. Sometimes, all you need is simplicity. With the amount of other cartoons and movies that I watch, this was a nice little palate cleanser that doesn't offer too much in terms of substance, but offers a whole lot in otters. That for made no sense. TLDR, it's simple, easy to understand, and a delight for the eyes because it just looks so good. But what happened to the show? Where did PB&J Otter go? I did not intend for that to rhyme. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Set sail for adventures with PB&J at Lake Hoo-Ha. Now, splash over to Lake Hoo-Ha for PB and Jay Otter. The series ran for a total of 65 episodes for three seasons, hitting that golden Disney 65-episode limit, ending on October 15, 2000. When asked about the series cancellation, Jenkins didn't recall it being a big deal. He says that earlier on in cartoons, a 65-episode runtime was considered a good, solid enough run for a cartoon. Unless a series was a smashing sensation compared to the likes of SpongeBob SquarePants or shows to that nature, it it wouldn't usually continue past that set amount. He says that PB&J Otter was a solid performer that he would have liked to continue, but it just wasn't really in the cards for Disney, and that was understood well by the whole crew. It also doesn't hurt to mention the concept of a certain target demographic aging out of a cartoon, hence why airtime needs to be cleared for new series for younger kids to grow up and claim as their own. Speaking of being a solid performer, the music was an incredibly important part of the series. Every episode presents the otters with a conflict that they must solve by committing the crime of doing the noodle dance. <laughs> I'm kidding, the noodle dance is fine. And after marathoning the show, yeah, sometimes I do it in the privacy of my home. That's none of your business, I don't know why I'm telling you this. And you know, when thinking back onto the series, the noodle dance is pretty popular amongst past viewers of the show. Most likely because it was in every episode, but also because it was insanely catchy. Composers Dan Sawyer and Fred Newman put their talents to use, coming up with anywhere between four to eight songs per week. The two of them met while working on the Mickey Mouse Club in the early 1990s, and fostered an almost telepathic bond as they transitioned to different series like Doug. They would be able to work together incredibly well, Sawyer knowing how to sing and vocalize, and Newman knowing how to musically transform the vocals with Sawyer into a fully fleshed out song. This came in handy considering how tight of a schedule they were working on. On many occasions, they had to just come up with a phrase and come up with something on the spot only to move on to the next one right after. The two were so successful successful on the series that PB&J Otter was nominated for an Annie Award in 2000 for Outstanding Individual Achievement in Music for an Animated Television Production. Jenkins was pretty set on wanting the series to have its own unique sound. He wished to create a whole world of music for the series that was new and exciting for kids, so he pushed to incorporate unconventional music tones, using instruments like accordions and mandolins to create a kind of mellow bluegrass genre. The team was able to do just that. In terms of lyrics, it was important 
certain to Sawyer and Newman that the sounds were targeted towards young kids, who, as many of us know, just love to make noise, using stimulation words to make it easy for a kid to sing along. While they pushed the music production pretty heavily due to the high volume, the scripts were something that they tried to take their time on. Having writer Eric Weiner, Jenkins attributes a lot of gratitude and writing credit towards his talents, along with the television series, a few online games such as Baby Butter's Big Catch, What's Different at Lake Hoo-Ha, and Whose Shoes were available to play online. But who needs to indoctrinate their kids to big tech when you could just give them some books? PB&J Otter had a lot of success in the literary market publishing works such as Butter's First Words, Peanut Shapes, PB&J's Hide and Seek, Noodle Dance, and so many more. Although there hasn't been much talk about PB&J Otter recently, they did have a solid amount of airtime with reruns on Playhouse Disney until 2005, and Disney Junior until 2014. But while what I said before about it being kinda off the radar still holds true, Disney Plus just recently, on October 19th, 2022, released the entire show, all three seasons on their streaming service. Fans were incredibly excited to learn that another Jenkins classic had been made readily accessible. While it was not made for an adult audience to thoroughly enjoy upon a nostalgia trip you're seeking, it is a very charming show that looks great thanks to its style being very reminiscent of Doug, as well as how vivid the colors in the show are. It just looks overall really great and filled me up with nice warm feelings of the years in my early life that I barely remember fully. But this show brought back some of those carefree feelings from those days. If or when I have kids, I think this would be a fun show for them to watch. But I got what I needed out of my revisiting of the series. So how about you? Did you give this show a revisit when it dropped on Disney Plus? Did you end up wanting a nice tasty peanut butter and jelly sandwich after watching this video? Let me know in the comments. Thanks so much for watching. Like and subscribe. Later.